Hello everyone, and thank you for taking the time today to join Ed Klonowski, Product Manager for Geico, and myself, Jason Loftus, Director at Geico Flex. First and foremost, we want to thank everyone that was able to attend our first webinar, How to Choose the Right Type of Coating for Your Roof. Phenomenal feedback, loved the engagement, and really appreciate the time you gave us. Because of that success, we're going to continue our series, starting today with the economic and environmental impact of coatings. So in doing this, our goal today is to present to you that tying together economic and environmental advantages and how they're directly correlated and how these two benefits together are actually going to continue driving the growth of the commercial roof coatings market. But to do this, I think we kind of probably have to get over the hump of how can you tie these two together, right? Uh, traditionally speaking, I think people would think environmentally friendly, probably more expensive. Um, our goal today is, is, is get you over that and, and show you how tying these together will be a win. Um, and, and that really comes into play with the building owner, right? So when we're talking to building owners and we can talk about the value proposition economically of roof coatings to a building owner and then the environmental advantages of using a roof coating to the building owner, that's a win. But when we can also, after today, talk through the long-term economic advantages from choosing roof coatings, then, then that's really where you're going to tie into that. But first and foremost, Ed, if you could, why don't you talk about the cost positioning of roof coatings in market and actually going through the systems of roofs because we do need a roof before we can put down a roof coating. Right, and yeah, we definitely want to tackle that 800 pound grill in the room after what Jason said about an environmental solution also being economic. Right. And when you think environmental, you think your low VOC adhesives or you think your HFO spray foams that typically have a price premium associated mm -hmm. with them at this point in time. And you know, to, to take a broader view, let's look at some of the most common roofing systems in market today. And to start, let's look at your Torchdown SPS and APP solutions. So these are some of the oldest systems in market, time tested and proven, um, phenomenal systems, but due to how they are constructed, also very costly to install. And you know, these are multiply systems, so obviously you have layer after layer. Um, great for redundancy, but from a material standpoint, definitely hits your bottom yeah. line. Uh, but then also the installation aspect associated with that. So you also have to install all of these different layers to complete this assembly. So all of this in a, uh, a roofing market that continues to transition to single ply solutions means that your labor pool is also dwindling. You mm -hmm. know, as these guys um, with specialized installation knowledge about these torch systems are retiring, they're not being replaced with similar um, skill sets. You know, right. they're moving over to single ply solutions. So, you know, overall, the you know the built up solutions represent a phenomenal bulletproof system, but one that's more at the upper echelon from a cost perspective. And moving down kind of one tier from a cost perspective is what's one of the biggest competitors to these solutions, and that is your single ply fully adhered system. Mm -hmm. So these are your PVC, your EPDM, your TPO single ply systems that are also fully adhered. And by fully adhering them, you maintain a lot of the physical performance characteristics when we talk about uplift, uh, but transitioning to a single ply top coat instead of the built up plies in the previous system. So obviously a lot of material and a lot of labor savings associated with going this route by comparison. And to bring us down one further tier, this is where we get into probably one of the most widely installed systems in market, and that is your mechanically attached single ply solutions. And with these, you are foregoing obviously the adhesives and screwing the membrane directly to the deck with a fastener and plate. Now what you're foregoing by doing that is obviously covering every square foot of the roof, and in many instances, every square foot of the membrane with adhesive waiting for that to flash off, rolling your membrane in, and then setting the membrane. Um, so obviously, you know, the labor savings alone is pretty substantial, but also the cost savings and not having to purchase all that expensive adhesive adds up. Um, all at the expense of a little bit of uplift. So, you know, all three of these are fantastic solutions, mm -hmm. ones that will last for decades on most roofs. Um, and the question is then asked, you know, where do liquid applied coatings fit in with this? Yeah. Um, and if you have one of these systems, you know, still performing, well-maintained, still watertight, you know, what need is there to tear it off when it le gets towards the end of its warranted period? 
And that's where coatings come in. You've made the initial investment with your insulation, with your top coat, if it's a, a built-up system, if it's a single-ply system that's still performing well, you can coat that, extend and prolong the life of that solution for 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, a lot of these coatings you put down at similar thicknesses to your um, uh, comparable single ply, mm -hmm. so 45, 60 mil total thickness, um, and as a result, get a similar warranty period. Not to mention, you know, within coatings, you know, some of the benefits of the different chemistries that mm -hmm. are out there. So if you look at urethanes, for example, with the impact advantages they have, or silicones with the waterproofing characteristics and ponding water capabilities that they offer, or even acrylics when you look at, um, you know, transitioning to a ref reflective roofing system, or, you know, aesthetic appeal, you know, they all offer various benefits that can be used to enhance your already performing system. Right. And all at different price points as well. So even within right. this last category, you know. Yeah, within the coatings, they, they, they themselves are, are tiered. Right, right absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, but by doing this and extending your roof, you are also foregoing scraping off all of that previous um, investment, you know, your insulation, mm -hmm. your fasteners, your adhesives, your membranes, and ultimately having to throw those in a landfill. Right, so let's, let's, let's talk about the, the, let's dig into that a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think you just did a great job of talking about the, the positioning of coatings. Um, and, and you position them as a maintenance coating. So let's, let's be clear about that, right? right. You, you have all of those roof assemblies, which are all phenomenal assemblies, and then you get to your point of a maintenance coating as a solution, right? So to do that, we have to talk about the life cycle of a roof, okay? So you've, you've tied in the economic advantage. How do we tie in the environmental advantage, right? And that is your three different life cycles of a roof. You have your, and you're talking to a building owner, you have your primary life cycle, and that is the initial sale of the building, the, the, when you build the building itself and you put the initial roof on, okay? That's your first generation roof. Uh, with that, you get, let's say, a 20-year warranty, okay? So as that 20-year warranty begins to near its end, um, again, before the warranty is, is out of warranty, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you're, you're looking at two options. One, you could take the economic advantage you just discussed and, and coat the roof, right, and get another 10, 15, 20 years. But more often than not, what you're going to find is the business owner is probably going to make the decision to, to recover the roof, all right? When you recover the roof um, with another roofing assembly system, you've now done your second generation roof, right? So again, we're going to talk about this a lot today, and that is a lot of this is codes driven. Okay, so once you've put that second generation roof on, you now have two roofs on this building. Okay, so when you put that second roof on and you get another 20 year warranty, what you're doing now is that as that warranty is near its end, you again have two options. Except this is where the environmental advantage comes in, and that is, and, and, and it, I, I should say tied together with the economic advantage, is you can one, coat that roof, with a maintenance solution, uh, cost effective, and extend that roof out another 20 years, or B, you tear it off, okay? So if, if option B comes into play, really now you've tied the economic and environmental advantages because one, it's gonna be more expensive. Uh, two, as you can see, 40% of all landfill waste comes from construction projects, okay? So now what you're doing is we've tied these two together, okay? But I think it's important to also talk about long-term, and that is how do the economic and environmental advantages contribute to the building owner long-term, and that's with energy savings, right? Right, let's talk about that in guise of energy efficiency and climate change. Uh, if we look at the install base of buildings across the U.S., uh, about 70% of them still have traditional non-reflective roof mm -hmm. surfaces. And when I say non-reflective, I'm talking a solar reflective index or SRI of about 10%. And these represent uh, your systems like your EPDM, your built-up, um, APP, SBS type solutions. And what happens with these solutions is as they are hit by solar radiation, that energy is absorbed into the system and conducted into the building as well as radiated into the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. Now, this phenomenon has been studied for a couple decades at this point, and as a result of that, there's been a number of uh, approvals, certifications, and ultimately codes developed, mm -hmm. uh, such as Energy Star, CRC, and Title 24, that are really starting to push the reflective 
roofs, especially in urban environments. And when I say reflective roofs, uh, basically you're transitioning from a solar reflective index of 10% up to mid 80s 80, yeah, plus or minus, plus. depending on what you put up there. Um, and one of the benefits coatings has to offer is they are a very cost effective solution to tr make this transition. So to kind of talk about you know, what happens internally to a building in this phenomenon, let's talk in, in terms of lead points or lead credits. And within LEED, there's obviously a number of different categories where you can qualify for points. So we'll pick a few of them that directly tie to um, reflective roof surfaces. The first being energy and atmosphere. So when that energy is absorbed into your roofing system and conducted into a building, you know, it, it is heating your building. And that directly impacts the cooling that needs to be done by your HVAC system. And when we look at operating expenses for the typical building, HVAC costs for, represent about 40% of the operating costs of a facility. So by transitioning to a reflective roofing surface and eliminating that conduction, you, know, you are directly impacting your bottom line in HVAC savings. Um, another area within LEED is indoor environmental quality. And you know we, we talked about obviously conditioning space with HVAC units, but what about unconditioned spaces? And this is where we're looking at you know things like warehouses or stuff of that nature. Right. Uh, simply by transitioning to a reflective roof, you are lowering the ambient temperature, which can be good obviously for the materials being stored in that facility, but also for those that may occupy that facility part time or full time. So a number of benefits there. And then you know one of the last things on the lead scale is you know your solar reflective index. We discussed going from a non-reflective 10% roof to, to a highly reflective, you know, mid 80s uh, roof, and the advantage is there, um, not just internally, but also, you know, looking externally. And this is where we start getting into the urban heat island effect. So, to to give a, a high-level overview of what this is, if you look at den uh, population density in various areas, so you look at rural environments that have a lot of green space, minimum buildings and, and roofs, as you shift to more traditional downtown areas, commercial, urban residential areas, you know, that green space quickly dwindles and is replaced by lots of buildings with lots of roofs and uh, the vast majority of them being non-reflective. So with that solar radiation being absorbed into those systems and then radiated into the surrounding atmosphere, you are artificially increasing the ambient temperature of that environment. And that has direct impacts to not only air quality and water quality, but also the ecosystem mm -hmm. as a whole. And then tying it back to your building costs, you know, you always condition your space against an external environment. And if you are artificially increasing the temperature of your external environment, that just further impacts what you have to do from an internal side when you condition that and cool that space using your HVAC equipment. So once again, you know, kind of a savings. double impact there uh, from a savings perspective with cool roofs. But then, you know, kind of looking outside of that local, you know, downtown or metropolitan area, you know, from a global perspective, you know, if you're heating all of these little commercial urban areas, um, that also has a direct impact on global warming as mm -hmm. a whole. Right. Um, so that, you know, that I think, Ed, first off, great job explaining both the positioning of coatings in the market, in the commercial roofing market, um, economically. And then, as you can see, uh, environmentally, there's also the advantage in, in positioning of that. Um, but what we've done so far is talk about it from a maintenance perspective. Mm -hmm. But b before we finish up here, I think we need to talk about our sustainable roofing systems. Okay. And, and here at GECO, we do have sustainable roofing solutions as well. And that starts with, you, you mentioned global warming, that starts with our low GWP or low global warming potential GECO roof foam, okay? Um, that product, self-adhering, high R value, um, used in conjunction with one of our Geico protective top coats is actually one of the only sustainable roofing systems in the market today, okay? Um, and it checks the boxes. It's, it's renewable because, again, codes driven. Mm -hmm. You can put down your foam, you put down your top coat. If you do a 10-year warranty, you can come back every 10 years, and because you're not limited by codes, as long as you maintain that roof, you can extend that existing roof life's cycle by renewing it with another coating. So you've, you've checked the cost, you've checked the environmental, you've tied everything together. Um, so where does that lead us into the future? 
right? And I think first and foremost, we can say that there will be continued expanded use in roof applications, both new, as I just discussed with our foam and coating solutions, and as, a, as existing or maintenance solutions, okay? Again, most of this is gonna be co-driven. It's gonna be co-driven at uh, city, county, state, federal, globally. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna start being mandated. We're gonna continue to look for ways to provide more energy savings, to cool roofs, uh, reduce our carbon footprint, right? Um, right. And, and, and as we continue to do that, we're gonna be um, looking at things such as solar. Right, I mean, yeah, solar, you know, especially when you talk about low slope roofing right. solutions, you know, solar is an amazing opportunity with these spaces that are exposed to 24, well, not 24 seven, but you know, a substantial right. yeah, amount only of- during the daytime. Yeah, <laughs> during the daytime. Uh, but exposed to a lot of uh, ultraviolet radiation right. that you, know, you can take advantage of. So one of the trends that's actually grown is, you know, when these solar arrays are installed, um, typically post commissioning of the building, so 10, mm -hmm. 15, 20 years after the fact, um, a lot of building owners want the warranty of their solar array to match that of their roof. Right. And that's an area that coatings comes into play right. they're not very done, nicely. They're not done at the same time. The solar panels right. aren't usually installed with the roof. So the roof's existing, it's already into its warranty stage. Right, so you, you install a brand new solar array and you match that warranty mm -hmm. with an appropriate coating thickness and chemistry. Um, not only are you matching the warranty, but now you're also ensuring that you have a reflective roof. So right. you're increasing the efficiency of that system. So, you know, a lot of benefits, not only from a, uh, uh, a warranty standpoint, but also from an overall environmental standpoint. Right, so to, to kind of conclude things, we, that's what we want to look at, right, is, mm -hmm. is our overall environmental footprint. Um, and and fo coatings and foam, for that matter, um, two things, staging and freight, okay? Um, staging in the way of, do you, we need a boom truck today, do you not? Can you use service elevators, right? What do you need on site to get that product up on the roof? It, mm -hmm. it, it, more than likely less, okay? Right. Um, but also from a staging standpoint of how much, how much warehouse space does it take up, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then on the freight side, when you look at how much product can you get onto site and then how many square feet you can cover, uh, a set of Geico roof foam covers generally or roughly 3,000 board feet. So that's 3,000 square feet at one inch, okay? There's 38 sets on a truck. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're covering a lot of squares. The, the same holds true for our coatings, uh, specifically our silicone. So you can do a, a, a 10 year spec um, and when you look at how many gallons are on a pallet, there's 36 fives or 180 gallons. So you're, you're well above 10,000 square feet on one pallet, 18 to 20 pallets on a truck. Again, your, your freight impact is low, your staging area is low, mm -hmm. yet your capacity to cover rooftops is high, okay? Right. So um, I thank you for the time today, Ed. And yeah, uh, as, as always, we're finishing up here. This was a 100,000 uh, foot view, right? We're, we're, we're talking from a studio here live with you. <laughs> and um, what we wanna also talk about though is the local viewpoint, okay? And we have a national coverage of, of area managers, distribution managers, regional managers, and we'd like for you to reach out to them. You can find them at geico.com backslash representatives. Type your zip code in and, and we'll get back to you as, as soon as we can. Thank you for your time today very much. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions or want to learn more about Geico, please reach out to your local area manager at geico.com backslash representative.